Everyone knows the best part of KFC is the skin, and whatever being or god or what have you that created this monstrosity clearly knew that because it kept all the skin for itself. Not quite a horse and not quite a man, the Nuclea V comes to us from the depths of Scottish mythology and... Yikes. So welcome to Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up old monsters from D&D's past or just from mythology in some cases and convert them to use for you in 5th edition with a fancy monster stat block and all that stuff. My name is Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and this week we are talking about that thing. Something I didn't realize when we started Spooktober and doing all these kind of gross, scary monsters specifically for use in Halloween or just spooky-themed D&D games, was that there was going to be so many horses involved. And much like many fae, the way that humans or other mortals interact with the environment can greatly influence their behavior. In this case, the Nuclea V is prone to rising up out of the sea and killing everything when people disrespect Mother Earth and the natural world. However, it's less of a let me teach you how to respect nature and repair your ways and more of a I'm going to wipe the entire slate clean, destroying nature and mortal kind alike. It's bad for everyone. So maybe don't pull out all the weeds in your backyard or whatever. And just like the Tikbalang, the last horse-ish monster that we covered, this creature is also a fae. So I think if we're learning anything based on the pattern here, horses are terrifying. But horse horror aside, the Nuclea V offers a lot of really interesting plot hooks and is going to be really fun to run in combat. So today, like in every episode of this show, we're going to go over just exactly what this thing can do in battle, how it fights, and some of the tricks it has up its gross sleeves. I mean, it doesn't really have sleeves, it doesn't even have skin, but you get the point. And then of course we're going to talk about some plot hooks and some actual ways that we can use this baddie in our games. And as always, there is a stat block in the description of the video, so if you decide you want to use this monster or you'd like to follow along while we're talking about it, feel free to take a look at that. In any case, let's just jump right into it and talk about some... So first things first, as a horse, you better believe these dudes have a trample attack. If it moves at least 20 feet towards you and hits with its hooves, you have to make a strength save or else your ass is getting knocked on the ground and you're getting hoofed in the face a second time. Pretty standard horse stuff. However, these guys also carry with them a massive lance, which they can use to skewer you from 10 feet away. Again, also a bad time. So typically what it's going to do is run towards a target, attack twice with its lance, and then hoof it and try to knock the target on the ground, and then try to hit them again with their hooves. Or if you want to be really mean, make it do the trampling charge attack first, because then if that target is knocked on the ground, it will have advantage for that hoof attack and for those two lance blows. That's pretty mean, but you're also talking about a personified version of destruction and death, so... Something else I added to this creature, just because I thought it was kind of funny, but it's also an interesting combat mechanic because there are very few creatures where the way it's facing actually makes a difference. So I gave it a reaction called Buck, which is literally if someone walks behind it, it gets to make a hoof attack against them as a reaction. Because how many times have you had players try to flank a creature and that usually involves getting on the other side of it? So if your players go to get in that flanking position, they absolutely can, but they might get kicked in the face too. So that kind of covers just the general physical attacks that this thing has, but we haven't talked about really the supernatural abilities at its disposal aside from, you know, being what it is. Because there ain't nothing natural about that. These guys also have a pretty powerful breath weapon which is exhaled through the horse part of the creature out of its mouth and nostrils. This is essentially a cone of noxious wilting gas that causes a pretty substantial amount of poison damage and can also poison the target if they fail their saving throw. But the nastiest part about this is a creature who fails their saving throw is also subject to the Nuclea V's disease. And that is something called Mordachine Rot, which is something specific to this creature. It is a type of disease literally created by the presence of a Nuclea V. So when it exhales this wilting breath that's killing everything around it, if you really take in a big old nose full of that horse breath, you're gonna potentially contract a horrible disease. And when you contract it, you immediately gain one level of exhaustion, which sucks, and that can make fighting very difficult, but it doesn't just go away. You now have that disease, 
So at the beginning of every day, you get to make another saving throw, and if you can't shake it, you gain another level of exhaustion. And once you've gained a couple levels, you're gonna start making those saving throws with disadvantage, so you can kind of see where this starts to get out of hand. And if you can't pass that save for five days in a row, for those of you who are not aware, the final stage of exhaustion is straight up death. So unless you have some type of restorative potion or you have someone who can cast a spell like Restoration, you're going to need to start making those saves. But the thing about Mordashin Rot is inhaling the breath weapon isn't the only way to contract it. Anytime you touch this creature, which essentially means if you make a melee attack against it or vice versa, you have to make a saving throw. Once you've made that save, you're immune to it for 24 hours, so it's not like you're going to be rolling a save every single turn or multiple times on your turn if you're a fighter. But it does mean that through the course of a battle, almost everyone who interacts with this creature in one way or another is going to potentially contract this disease. So chances are, in an entire adventuring party, someone's not going to roll well, and this is a problem that the party's going to have to deal with. Which brings us into our next topic, so let's talk about some... So as I said towards the beginning of the video, these guys come to be, or at least come into the mortal realm, when Mother Nature is being disrespectful. I like to imagine the smog and acrid smoke associated with blacksmith forges or factories or mills that are just destroying huge swathes of forest would attract this creature almost as a beacon. Because after all, that would be the type of environment they would thrive in. So it's less about Mother Nature or some type of god setting this creature to punish the creatures involved. The Nucleaves is drawn to that and any living things there are going to pay the price. So let's talk about what that actually means. Because for one of these things to roll into town and be harassing people and spreading its disease and sickness, sure it's going to kill some civilians which is obviously a bad thing, and that might be what prompts the adventurers to get involved and try to take this thing down. But it's worse than that. Its breath and its mere presence is going to be wilting and destroying crops. You're also talking about the death and destruction of livestock, and even the carcasses will be unusable because they'll be so poisoned and just destroyed. You're talking about potentially poisoning the water source of an area, which can also be very detrimental. So disease and death is going to spread where the nuclear V rides, not even necessarily caused directly by it, but just because of its effect on the environment and how that affects the things the people who live there need to survive. Because of course, if you're not getting proper drinking water or proper food, Disease and that kind of thing is going to fester and spread regardless, and then when the nuclear V actually does get to that part of civilization, they're already going to be weakened and not be able to put up much of a fight. So you could easily intertwine plot lines where the adventurers don't really know at first what's happening and what's causing this plague, but they have to go to other towns and settlements to try to get supplies and get aid so that the people in their area aren't just suffering. Perhaps if it's a human settlement that's kind of new to the area, which would make sense given the fact that they're just abusing Mother Nature, they have to go to the elves and ask them for help, and the elves have lived in the wood for a thousand years, and maybe they're not so keen on the fact that the humans are even there, and how they react and how the party can try to get their help is a whole quest in and of itself. And maybe it's through communion with races that have been there for much longer that they find out about the nuclear V's existence and that it might be something they can fight or try to stop. If the party's very low level, this is a very difficult goal, so perhaps they just focus on doing what they can. Perhaps a nearby tribe of orcs or hobgoblins or something is using this current weakness in the human settlement to invade and pillage and loot. So they have to try to hold that off as much as they can. And then of course the ultimate build up to a session or campaign like that would be taking down the Nuclear V as the main boss. And perhaps there's even more than one of them. If you wanted to take that even a step further in terms of game difficulty, you could even have some type of Fey Lord, perhaps an Arch Fey who's just sick and tired of these mortals destroying the realm, and it has a bunch of Nuclear V Knights that do serve it directly and are meant to just purge whatever mortals they find. So it's not just one of these things, it's kind of five or six that are all knights of this Archfey. And if you were going to do that, you could develop them a little bit more, maybe give each one a couple specific magic items or a couple unique powers, maybe different types of plagues even, and they would have to defeat all of these plague lords before they can go after the main Archfey that's been messing with them. And all of that said, as I say in pretty much every video, you can throw all the lore straight out the window and just use these guys however you see fit. Given their grotesque appearance and their abilities, you could absolutely just recast this as a type of demon or even a devil if you are running a campaign that uses a lot of those creatures. 
Maybe you're playing Descent into Avernus and you want some more variety in addition to what that book gives you. These guys would make fantastic additions. Or hell, I mean, you could even use them as undead because, again, of their grotesque and deathly appearance, especially with their abilities to wilt and destroy life, they would make a really easy conversion to an undead monster. If you are planning a Halloween one-shot or even just a one-shot that you want to have kind of a darker tone, instead of a headless horseman type creature, you could always use a Nucula V as well, just that classic rider in the night who has a very grotesque appearance upon closer inspection. And something of note about this creature's appearance as well is it's very easy to think of it as a horse and rider, but it's one creature. This isn't two creatures fused at the waist and back. This is one coherent being. It just happens to have four eyes and two of them are in a human-like head that is way up here and the other two are in a horse-like head that's way down there. And the more I'm talking about this, the more disgusting it is and I hate it. But yes, getting back to the theme of it being used as a fey creature, something I find really interesting in creatures like this that exist sort of in the natural world, or supernatural, I guess, literally by definition, but that exist within the world in a specific place, is oftentimes the people that live near those areas will do different things to ward them. Perhaps every year there's some sort of harvest festival with themes of giving back to the earth and planting new trees and stuff like that, to kind of appease the nuclear beast spirit so that they don't get roused from sleep and try to kill everybody. <laughs> or perhaps there are different charms and baubles that the people of the specific area wear, so when your party is passing through, maybe they notice everyone has a specific type of ornament that they hang around their neck or around their waist pouches or whatever. And that can be a really interesting opportunity to build your world, even if you don't use this creature right away, it kind of just plants that seed that there is something out there these people are afraid of and they take precautionary steps to try to avoid it. And whether or not these steps actually work, totally up to you. But it can definitely be a nice touch when your players are getting into a new kind of strange locale. Anyways, that is pretty much everything I've got to say about the Nuka Levy. I think these guys are really spooky and I think they're just awesome creatures so I really look forward to seeing how you guys use them. If you ever used this creature in the past or you have plans to use it, please leave a comment and tell me all about it. And in addition, if you've got any monsters you'd like to see covered on the channel, again, leave a comment, get at me on Discord, Twitter, whatever. We have a whole thing on Discord specifically for monster suggestions so we can kind of catalog them and talk about them. And that is one of the main places I look at when I'm looking for inspiration on which creatures to cover. And if you like what I'm doing here and you want to support the channel, subscribing is the easiest, freest way to do that and it makes a huge difference. And of course, if you really like what I'm doing here, you can check out my Patreon, which the link is in the description there below as well. Every week when I do my Monster of the Week stat blocks, I always put up a Monster Manual style thing with a splash art and some plot book ideas and all that kind of stuff, like what you get in a Monster Manual book. And you can find... And you can find that there on Patreon at the $3 tier level as well. In addition to that though, for all of my patrons, I am currently working on a supplement that is going to include a brand new subclass for every single one of the classes, even the wizard. This past week I just released the Warlord Fighter, which I'm very excited about. It's shaping up to be really awesome. So I'm just kind of putting those out there for my patrons as a preview. At any tier you can take a look at it. and. I love getting your guys' feedback and we're kind of tweaking and balancing things and eventually it will be released as a product for everyone to buy. So if you're not on Patreon, don't worry, you will be able to get that stuff eventually. But that, I think, is everything. So thank you so much for watching. I do appreciate it and I will see you in the next video. Until then.